Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank you all. I, I know you're standing. I know many of you will get tired in a little bit speaking, but I want to say a few words to you. I want to first thank you for coming out. You know, this has been a long and enduring campaign. Very been, been very intense, uh, but we've got six days left. And the people and the people of Alabama are going to speak to the people in Washington, D.C. and across this nation what we're going to do in this country. We're going to bring it forward and quit sitting on our <laughs> chairs in Congress and get moving and make this country great again. I want to thank the, the speakers that have gone before me. I've, uh, Bill Owens is a wonderful fella. Uh, he's, he's seen hard times, and he stands for the truth. And he is a great fella from out in Nevada. Uh, Dr. Steve Bannon, or Steve Bannon, I should say. You know, somebody asked me what I thought about Steve Bannon. If he had helped me, I said, why, yes, of course. <laughs> He's a great strategist. I want to recognize my wife, Kayla. We've been married 33 years and a few days, and this is my middle son, Caleb. I want to thank Dean Young, who's done a great job in putting this together. It's been a lot of time. And I'm, I've said in the past that if I ever make a talk and this man was present, I will always introduce him. Because this man is very special to me. It's Colonel Glenn Frazier. He's sitting right down here in the corner. <laughs> Colonel Frazier, before any of us were born, was over in the Philippines fighting Japanese. And when MacArthur left, Glenn Fraser was still fighting the Japanese. He was captured. He was on the Bataan Death March. You don't have many people around in this country left who were on the Bataan Death March. They marched across the country and wound up in a concentration camp eventually in Japan, where he spent the remaining years of the war. He has seen hell, and he has overcome it. He was a fighter from South Alabama, and y'all give him a big hand, Colonel Glenn Frazier. I'll tell you something about Colonel Frazier. He just turned 94. And he stands for the Pledge of Allegiance. And he stands for the National Anthem. And I hope we'll all follow his example. You know, we're a little over a year from the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump was elected by the people of Alabama and the people of America to make a change in this country. But here, are, here we are a little over a year later, and what happened? We still have no wall. We still have illegal aliens crossing the border. We still have Obamacare. We still haven't passed the tax program, working on it. We still have NAFTA. We still have CAFTA. Why isn't he able to get these things done when he's tried so hard? 
Well, I think he does want to. No. Mitch want Mitch doesn't want to. He's having a group of congressmen. We call the establishment. I don't want to throw out words without explaining them. What is the establishment? There's a Republican establishment. There's a, a Democratic establishment. Let's get, get it straight. Doing the same thing. They don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their prestige, their power. They want to stay just where they are and play a game while the people of America suffer. We've got to get a program going in Washington, D.C. You know, these politicians remind me of Christopher Columbus. You know, Christopher Columbus left Spain after he had been well financed by the king and queen, and he came to America. He didn't know where he was going when he came here. When he got here, he didn't know where he was. And when he left and went back home, he couldn't say where he had been. But he spent all the money. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of the politicians we have in Washington, D.C. now. Except I, want, I won't criticize Christopher Columbus, because I tell you, he had something they don't have in Washington. He had courage. <laughs> he had a purpose. And that was to discover the new world. He didn't quit with that one voyage. He came back three other times. And finally, he had faith. The first thing he did on December 5th, 1492, 525 years ago, was plant a cross on the beach at Haiti, where he landed. So to be fair to Christopher Columbus, I won't, won't compare him to the politicians of today. This race has been a very unusual race. I mean, it's been unusual from the very beginning. I've never seen a race where so many national figures have come to Alabama. I understand we have Soros' army here. I don't know if any of these people that have left were part of Soros' army. But they're working around the state to get the vote of the people of Alabama to change. We've had, and why is it so special? It's a special because it's a precursor. You see, Donald Trump did one of the most tremendous things I think anybody could do. He fought both the Republicans and the Democrats and became President of the United States. Now, I can only speak from my personal experience, but I remember when he was elected that I felt like a big weight had been taken off my shoulders. I don't know if any of you can identify with that, but it felt like we had another chance. And we do have another chance, but if we don't take this opportunity to address the issues in this country, we're going to lose it. So then comes the Senate race in Alabama, which was caused by the vacancy of Jeff Sessions on the election and on his appointment to the Attorney General's office. It left a vacancy in the Senate. And this Senate race is the only Senate race going. It's the first Senate race since Donald Trump was elected. And it means something special. It means that we're going to see if the people of Alabama will support the president and support his agenda in Washington by electing somebody that's not part of the establishment there. This race is special because there's been a whole lot of money spent in this race. When I got into this race, I had no idea. I've been outspent in every race I've ever run by about seven to one. But this race, 15 to one in the primary. When I got through the primary and I survived the primary, I thought it would be a little easier. Now we're spending, seeing 10, 
to $12 million being spent by the Democrats in this race, and you can tell that on television compared to what we've raised. We've raised money the hard way. We've struggled, but we've overcome. And I think on December 12th, you'll see an election that the world won't forget. You know, when I was elected, or when I was, um, won the primary, I didn't even, before that, I didn't even know about the Senate Leadership Fund. I didn't know what it was. I do now. It's to keep the incumbents in place. To keep those that have got a job, got a position, from leaving as long as they follow. They don't want me up there. I know that. Somebody once told me, you, you know, some people don't like you. <laughs> because I'm a little, a little naive. But I understand they don't want somebody up there with an independent mind, somebody that will do what they believe is right under the Constitution, <laughs> and won't follow along, and that's why they don't want me. In fact, I think Mr. Bannon mentioned this. They would rather have a Democrat there than me in the Republican Party. It's different because we've start, I've seen a new low in false advertisements. It started against Mo Brooks. I wasn't the first. And as soon as I was in the runoff, it started against me. They've attacked my wife. They've attacked the foundation we started. They've attacked my judicial decisions. They've attacked my property taxes. They've attacked everything I know. And most recently, my character. I don't know if you've ever fought a spiritual battle. You know, in Ephesians it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I'm going to tell you about a little bit about this fight. There are things we just can't handle. There are things that we just can't overcome. But we've got one obligation, and that's to stand. That's to stand, not just for ourselves, but for the people of this country who can't fight this battle. If you knew what kind of battles I've been fighting, you wouldn't want to be where I am. In fact, if I wasn't here, I wouldn't want to fight those battles. But when God puts you there, you have nothing else to do but to stand. There's been a lot of fake news. There's been a lot of diversion. You know, when Donald Trump got elected, what was the first thing that happened? We had demonstrations. We had protests. We had so many that by the time they wore out, they ran out of diversions till they got the Russian investigation. Now they've been on the Russian investigation for nearly a year. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't really matter if you elect Donald Trump if they keep on the Russian investigation because we're not going anywhere. We've got to get to the issues that this country needs resolved like health care. We need to repeal Obamacare. We, we need to repeal Obamacare immediately. We need to stop illegal aliens coming across our border. We don't need, you know, I heard about this kitchen table issues. You know what a kitchen table issue is? Like transgender bathrooms, that's a pretty good kitchen, kitchen table issue. Like transgender in the military. I'm a military. I, I have served in the military. I was in Vietnam. 
I was a company commander. I was at United States Military Academy where I learned military tactics and strategy. And I know we do not need transgender in our military. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I'm in a foxhole, I don't want to know whether this guy next to me is wondering if he's a woman or a man or flip back, back and forth. That's not a military. We need a strong military and it's going to affect the people of this country. Abortion. I have said very clearly Roe versus Wade is not established precedent. It's a violation of the Constitution. I will never backtrack on that. If we can't defend the most innocent lives in our country, then we can't do anything. And we're seeing millions of young Americans killed because of abortion. Religious freedom. You know, Somebody asked me how I differ from my opponent, and I said in everything. <laughs> but I want to tell you one that really touches me. This is a question he was asked by The Economist. It's on economist.com. How can you reassure his supporters, talking about my supporters, that you're not out to take away their religious freedom or their guns, their culture? I'll read you his answer. I don't know if I can. I think actions have to speak louder than words, so once I get elected, I can try to do it. But look, when you talk about their Christian beliefs and stuff, that's one thing. But when you talk about their culture, I'm not sure what you mean by that. If culture means that you have to put down people, if your culture means that you would discriminate against somebody, that you would not treat anybody in the same way that Christ would do, then I'm not going to protect that. I'm not going to protect discrimination of any sort, in any way, whether it's race, religion, sex orientation, or whatever. So I'm not going to protect that culture if that's what their culture is. Now let me tell you how you translate that. If your Christian culture, if your beliefs do not accept abortion, same-sex marriage, sodomy, transgender rights, in their school bathrooms, and in the military, then by definition, you are discriminatory and will not be protected, nor will your rights to own and carry guns be secured. Doug Jones was not only a Clinton appointee, but also a Barack Obama delegate. Obama in 2008 said people like us would become frustrated and cling to our guns and our religion. It's the same concept that my opponent is talking about. Right now, before the United States Supreme Court, is a case called Master Pete's Cake, in which a man didn't want to address the design of a cake to a homosexual couple. And that case has been heard today in oral argument. That's the kind of thing that we don't want to give up in this country. Our religious freedom is very precious. It's very precious to our founding fathers. In March of 1775, the year before the Declaration was signed, there was a group of men in the Virginia House of Burgesses who were debating about giving support to the northern colonies in their quest for freedom. They couldn't meet in Williamsburg because they were driven out by the governor, appointed by the king. So they went to a little church called St. John's Church in Virginia. There we have some of the most notable persons of the revolution. Patrick Henry, the tongue of the revolution. Thomas Jefferson, the pen of the revolution, and George Washington, the sword of the revolution. In 
And what they were talking about is the same thing we're here today about. What are we going to do? Where are we going in this country? In fact, Patrick Henry said this. He said, the question before us is one of awful moment to our country. For my part, I consider it nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And should we keep back our opinions at such a time as this, I should consider myself guilty of treason toward my country and an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Which way will our country go? The question before us today in this election is which way will the people of Alabama go being watched by everybody in the nation and around the world if we're going to change and make progress or are we going to sit and stay where we are and then let the Democrats come back and take us back further. He said, it is natural for man to indulge in the illusion of hope. And we've indulged in the illusion of hope. We hope Donald Trump would get elected. We hope something would happen in our country. But now we've got to do something about it. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the sound of the siren until they transform us to beast. Or listen to the pundits and people who write about these issues in Washington, avoiding them. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided. Now we know the lamp is the word of God. But he was putting it in a secular sense by saying, I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I want to ask you one question. What has there been in the conduct of the American government in the last ten years to justify those hopes which so many have been pleased to solace themselves? Nothing. There's no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we wish, if we mean to preserve inviolable those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we've been so long engaged, we must fight. An appeal to the God of hosts is all that has left us. We've got to go back to God. We've got to go back to restore the morality of this country. That's right. He said this. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen, may Christ peace, peace, but there is no peace. That's what so many people want in our country today. They want peace. They don't want to get out and fight for the privileges and things that we've been given. Why stand we here idle? What is it that the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Is peace so sweet? Is to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Amen. I don't ever talk about honor. It's something you don't talk about. It's something you just do. When I had to leave my job because I stood for the Ten Commandments. It was because the law didn't, didn't say anything about not having the Ten Commandments. Congress shall make no law respecting the established religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Doesn't forbid you from acknowledging God. Without the acknowledgement of God, you wouldn't even have that provision. It's God who's given us our rights. If government gives our rights, it'll take them from us. We've got to go back to recognition of God. You know, I've been called many names. I won't repeat them all. <laughs> but because I oppose Common Core, I've been called uneducated. I've been called out of touch when I stood for the Constitution because it's outdated, you know. I've been called a warmonger when I want to rebuild our military. I've been called a racist merely for saying I would protect our borders. A bigot because I stood against the sanct I stood for the sanctity of marriage. 
and against same-sex marriage. And I've been called a rebel because I had the dastardy to pose federal courts putting themselves over the Constitution we're all sworn to uphold. And finally, what hurts most is I've been called foolish for believing in God. See, what I think, I think they're afraid that I'm going to take Alabama values to Washington. And I want to tell you, I can't wait. Thank you.